episode 227 of the Whatnots Review Show, where every week we pick a story and we talk about it. This could be a movie, TV series, anime, manga, comic book, audio drama, all kinds of entertainment. We watch it, read it, listen to it, and then we come back here and we discuss it. My name is Melissa Wilkinson, and I am joined, as always, by Kyle Springer. Hello. How are you doing, Melissa? I'm doing good. How has your weekend been? My weekend has actually been great. Ah. On Saturday, I went to the comic book store. I picked up volume 10 of Saga, as well as volume 5 of Something is Killing the Children, uh, which was, uh, I jumped into both of those immediately, and they are fantastic. I've been waiting so long for Saga to finally be back, and it's here. I'm so excited. Uh, And then today was, uh, like, date afternoon with my girlfriend and uh we went to a pumpkin patch we went on a hay (gasps) ride we went to a petting zoo and got some pumpkins uh and then on our way home we stopped at a pops is what it's called it's a giant gas station but the inside is a it it is both like a 50s style diner And Uh they have any and all soda you can think of. Uh, But it's all like smaller craft stuff. When you came to visit me, uh, you brought me a bunch of Fitz's soda. They had it there. They had Fitz's. Nice. Uh, So I can get all sorts of flavors of that stuff. Uh, I will have those on the captain's log this next week, and I will try Ooh. one out for the next couple weeks here, like we did, did, did with the ones that you bought me. Uh, awesome! Back then, I'm so, happy yeah. you've got a local Fitz's hookup. Yeah, we sure do. And then after that, we went to a pizza place, and I had it was a honey sriracha pepperoni pizza with Whoa. garlic and like the, those mozzarella this uh, man it was so good oh man it was fantastic so i've had a great weekend that's a busy day <laughs> yeah yeah it was I, good we're we're recording in the evening because i uh, spontaneously went to a theater matinee today i texted you last night like if i get tickets to the theater can we record it at nighttime? <laughs> Yeah, well, it's it's your birthday week. It so is. First of all, happy belated birthday. I've Thank told you. you personally happy birthday on the date that it actually <laughs> you, you must tell was, me in each but, feed right? on each yeah. separate oh, yeah. podcast. Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but uh, but yeah, but yeah. So was, was was that the birthday related at all? Were you just like, you know what, for my birthday, I'm going to go see a play because why not? No, it was Hades Town was in town and mm. I had I was aware of it. And earlier this year, I thought, oh, I ought to go see that. But then I had other expenses come up. I put it out of my mind and I was visiting my friend Ashley yesterday and she was going to go. And I'm like, you know what? I think I can join you. I think I can do it. That's cool. That's uh, cool. Hades Town. Wonderful production. I think it's touring and I think it's going to be in your town soon. So you oh, too can see it. We were almost about to, we're, we're, we were thinking about getting tickets to, to um, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Uh, they were j- 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 doing a, a stage play of that, but I think we might be a little too busy over the, the next couple weekends. So we might not get to go to that, but fun stuff. Fun stuff, mm-hmm. indeed. Well, Melissa, what are we here to talk about on the podcast this week? This week, we are talking about a film from the silver screen master of horror, Vincent Price. We are watching 1971's The Abominable Dr. Fibes, uh, which is directed by Robert Fust. Fust. It's guest, but spelled with an F. Best? I would say This Robert person Fest. directed it. Robert Fest directed this film. But I, yeah, I don't know how you would pronounce that, but uh, I, we'll, we'll, we'll stick with that. We'll stick with fast. And if we're wrong, we apologize. Uh, but, but, but yeah, you you pitched me a series of Vincent Price movies because yeah. um, it is spooky month here at the review mm. show. So we're covering all sorts of different kinds of horror stuff of all all sorts. Uh, and you were like, you know what? I, I, we, we haven't done any kind of Vincent P- 
price stuff. I think you had also said like you personally haven't really seen a Vincent Price movie before. Like you, you know of him in pop culture and stuff like that. But yeah, we we all know Vincent Price. We've all heard his monologue in Thriller. We clearly we've seen him on Scooby Doo. Yep. Well, we know mm-hmm. when somebody is doing like a Vincent Price impression or homage, but I, I thought I had never seen a complete one of his movies. I realized he is the voice of Radigan, the villain in Disney's The Great Mouse Detective. Yep. <laughs> so I'd heard him, but I don't think I'd seen a complete Vincent Price movie before. And I thought I owed that to him uh, as he is a fellow St. Louisian like me. He's also yeah. from St. Louis. He's on our walk of fame. We all know him. I got to pay homage to my homeboy. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, I uh, I am re- really not super familiar with a lot of his actual filmography. So I yeah. was kind of in the same boat of like, yeah, I know him just from like pop culture osmosis and stuff like that. Um, I, I, I feel like I have seen something with him. I'm, I'm sure I have, but I just don't know what. Um, and, and that just speaks to how, like how much of an impact I I think he has Mm -hmm. on pop culture too. Right. I'm I'm just like, I feel like I must've seen something. Right. He seems omnipresent. (laughs) Like you're you're so familiar with his voice, with his demeanor. You think I must've seen this guy several times. Yeah. He's, yeah. He's so instantly familiar to you. Yeah, uh, but we ended up watching this one because I guess recently you were at uh, like an art fair or like a farmer's market yeah. or some something like that. Yeah, and I was at a local art festival. It was yeah. Let Them Eat Art in Maplewood. And I was talking to an artist. I believe the artist was Maxine 13. I bought some stickers, but I don't think I took a business card home. Uh, this was an artist who did some portraits of some uh, old classic Hollywood stars, including Vincent Price. And I asked, well, what are your recommendations? What are your favorite Vincent Price films? And Abominable Dr. Fives was, I think, the first one recommended. Yeah, good stuff. So I was like, you know what? I will take that recommendation. Let's do that one. And that's what we're here to talk about this week. The Abominable Dr. Fives. Mm -hmm. Um, Man, this. So I, I was looking at the Wikipedia page and it seems like this is on some like top 100 list of like influential horror movies or 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 just like ones of note not necessarily yeah. like these are the best but just like a, yeah you you should check this one out mm-hmm. uh and this is i i don't think it's necessarily good per se but it's not bad there's some things in there that i'm that i'm like there's some great stuff in in here the yeah. set d- 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 design <gasps> is beautiful some of the colors uh just how vibrant the the whole movie is is really not something you see in mm-hmm. a lot of horror movies uh i can only think of like sus like the original suspiria that was like oh yes. man these like vibrant colors um but then just the way it's kind of shot, the way it's kind of directed is unfortunately kind of bland in comparison to oh. this stuff. Uh, oh, I think there's some incredible shots in here. There, There is some really interesting stuff in, in there for sure. Like, um, it's not uh, like I just... <laughs> I, I wish there were like better looks at some of the things in here. Uh, mm. But there are some sequences that I, I loved. I enjoy, enjoyed it a lot. I was like, this is cool. This is interesting. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I, I think at the end of the day, I had a blast. Uh, but don't go. I, I think don't go into this expecting to be like super horrified or scared. There's no real jump no. scares. There's some some good comedy in here too uh but it is i think especially for its t- time pretty creepy story yeah i want to start by reading the movie description that i read you last week when i was yes pitching please this, which is just pulled from that google sidebar in a desperate attempt to reach his ill wife organist anton fibes is horrifically disfigured in a car accident and presumed dead 
When he learns that his wife died during an operation, Fibes blames her surgeons and plots an elaborate revenge to punish them for their incompetence. With the help of a mute assistant, Fibes creates a mask resembling his own face and murders the surgeons one by one using bizarre methods inspired by the biblical plagues. Qu- quite a plot description. It takes Sold. the actual movie yeah. a surprisingly long time to lay out to you that that's what is happening. We just see some deaths and we see a guy playing a giant organ. It takes you like 30, 40 minutes to learn like, oh, this is this guy's name. This is the revenge mission he's on. This is how he's going about it. This is why he wants these people killed. Like the structure of this movie is really odd you really have to do a lot of the work to try and put the thing together it's sort of mysterious and and aloof in that way (laughs) i thought it was a real fascinating watch just how it was not what i expected plot and structure wise and went beyond what i expected in terms of the visuals there's some fascinating tableaus in here Mm -hmm. like his animatronic band he plays the organ surrounded by this animatronic band of just these like six dull figures with like blank faces just (laughs) clomping around on instruments this is like sub Chuck E. Cheese I was about to say eat your heart out Chuck E. Cheese good (laughs) luck Charles Entertainment (laughs) Cheese step your game up (laughs) he's got a greater band who is doing greater music but they've just they look like Fisher Price little people. There's like no detail on their face. They're just like kind of blocky. And the movie just starts. You just with start that, yeah. with like this animatronic band starting up. And then he like rises from the floor playing the organ. And then you see him like put his face on. And you're like, where am I? Who is this? What's happening? And I really it's admire a, a movie that chooses to start with no explanation to you. I think that's great. The movie time after time was a surprise. Once you figure out, okay, he's killing all the people who he thinks played a hand in his wife's death and he's following these biblical plagues. Okay. You've got that, but it puts a lot more surprise into it than you think. Uh, And like the way in which he murders people specifically tied to those plagues is so wild there is some bonkers deaths in here yeah for sure for sure it's it's a trip for sure um Mm -hmm. i i i think it was a great recommendation that we got and i would like to pass that along to all of you yeah there go check this out if you have not already uh I, i think it is worth watching the only place I found to watch it is some obscure app called Movieland.tv that I got on my Roku yep. that looks exactly like the Roku main menu. So I don't know if it, you can find it anywhere else. If you feel on any other device, you can watch Movieland.tv. Uh, but I really hope you're able to get your hands on this movie. I hope this is like revisited. I want like a criterion collection of this. I want the world to know Dr. Fives. Um, so something that I did not know going into this one uh, is that there's also a sequel to this yeah. Mayovies. Uh, I, I, I don't know the exact name of it, but from no, I've what got, I, I got all the stuff up. It's called uh, Dr. Fives Rises Again. That's what I was going to say. It, it, it was something like the classic, like Dr. Fives Returns or Dr. Fives Rises yeah. Again. Uh, and supposedly... His murder spree in that one takes him to Egypt and stuff like that. I don't know. But uh, yeah, you you don't necessarily need to watch that one to understand all the stuff that's going on. Uh, You can just watch this this first one and just be like, man, what an interesting movie. (laughs) Yeah. So go Uh, check it out. Before we. Yeah, before we go into housekeeping, I want to tell you I looked up Vincent Price, the the personal man, uh, because I was thinking nobody sounds like him. He's from St. Louis. He's from the same town I am. I've never met anybody who sounds like him. That's not a Midwestern accent. Like, does he have parents from Britain or something like that? Is that what gave him his unique voice? 
Uh, and I wanted to share you these details from his Wikipedia. He was born in okay. 1911 here in St. Louis. Uh, the youngest of four children of Vincent, L- Vincent Leonard Price, president of the National Candy Company. Hey. His wife, Marguerite Cobb Price. His grandfather was Vincent Clarence Price, who invented Dr. Price's baking powder, the first cream of tartar based baking powder, and it secured the family's fortune. <laughs> Price was of Welsh and English descent and was a descendant via his father's mother of Peregrine White the first child born in colonial Massachusetts being born on the Mayflower while it was in Provincetown Harbor. That's some rich history. Right. Uh, he, in- he attended a uh, St. Louis County country day school, which I think is like in my neighborhood. I think that's like 10 minutes away from here. Oh, wow. Yeah. It doesn't say if his family, if like his parents were directly from England or something. I'm just curious how he got s- such a unique timber to his voice uh, that, that sounds like nobody else from around here. Interesting. Interesting. Good stuff. Well, yeah, um, I think at that we will take a quick break for some housekeeping. And when we get back, we will dive into the abominable Dr. Fibes more in depth. So we will be right back. We put a lot of hard work into the shows that we make. And yes, we make multiple different shows here at The Whatnots, and we'd love it if you check them all out. You can find out more information on our website at thewhatnots.com, as well as your favorite podcasting platform of choice. When you type in The Whatnots, all of our shows will pop up right there. Just don't forget to give us a nice rating and review if you like the shows. If you want to support what we do here at The Whatnots, patreon.com slash The Whatnots is the best place to do that. You can support us for as little as a dollar a month. You can get all kinds of exclusive content at the $3 tier. You can also get a shout out and a thank you on all of our shows at the $5 tier. You can support us on Twitch by subscribing to our channel at twitch.tv slash The Whatnots. And we would love to have you all join us for our live streams and talk with us in the chat. And lastly, we have merch. If you'd like to grab yourself a shirt or a sweatshirt or a mug or something else, go to the whatnots.com slash store to pick up some merch today. All right, and we are back. A big shout out to all of our Patreon supporters. Thank you all so much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Of course, if you are at the $3 tier, you get access to all of our exclusive content. Uh, And Melissa, you and I just recorded a Patreon exclusive podcast of our Pilots Club on Mockingbird Lane. Do you want to give a quick explainer of what Mockingbird Lane is? Yeah, this was a pilot from the mid 2010s that was not picked up to full series, but did air once as a TV special. And it is a reboot of the Munsters, co-created by Brian Fuller, who's uh, created shows like Pushing Daisies and Hannibal that we've covered here on the review show in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Speaking of on the review show, like I said, it's spooky month uh, here. Uh, It's October 2022. Uh, So it's all scary stuff all this month. Last week, we covered a manga by Junji Ito, uh, a collection of his short stories called Shiver. Uh, So I highly recommend checking that one out. Uh, On the captain's log, Melissa, it sounds like you're going to be running some kind of fantasy draft at your work. Uh, So you you uh, employed my my help to create a list of uh, at least 50 monsters uh, so yes. uh, how that you could run a monster j- j- raft uh, at, yeah. at work there. Uh, so this that is was what we're doing for our office Halloween party is we're all going to draft monster squads. <laughs> Sounds fun. Uh, last but not least on the reactor core, uh, we have our second Star Wars Andor reaction up for uh, episodes four through six. So please go check that one out. Uh, we also have our reactions to the finale of She-Hulk uh, yeah. on uh, or at least the finale of season one. It mm. seems like a season two has been confirmed in the works, but I also am not 100 percent sure on that because they've also seen more recent stuff that that is like Tatiana Maslali doesn't know if there's going to be a season two. So I was like, huh, okay, weird. But we have our reactions to She-Hulk up on the reactor core. 
Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, as well as Werewolf by Night from yeah. Marvel. So more, more yeah. scary stuff, more horror, Halloween, good, good fun times. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Uh, but that is the housekeeping for now. With that, I say let's get into spoilers. All right. Spoiler mode. So, yeah. So actually, the first thing that I want to talk mm. about is the whole description, like the, the structure of this yeah. movie, because this, I think, is one of the most fascinating things in this. You you already read the description, so I'm not going to repeat it, but. Essentially, that description is kind of the spoiler of the movie, but it's also n not per se like that. Like it's it's so weird because you don't yeah. find out that he is, like he's doing all of this because his wife died in surgery and he wants her revenge on the doctors. Yeah, until like halfway in the movie, it actually starts out more just like a crime like detective yeah. movie there's some murders that have happened uh th this this cop is on the scene he's trying to figure it out they're they're always like one or two steps behind mm. but in between all of that you kept being shown these like gruesome murder scenes uh or, or, or creative might be the right word because they're not that there's one or two in there that might be gruesome but just these just obscure bizarre murders uh yeah good show and, and i want to say Go the ahead. first one takes place off screen the first murder we see is like the second murder he does yeah. and then the police arrive on the scene and one of them's like did you hear about that other murder from a couple days ago where a guy was stung to death by bees this reminds me of that one. So one of these kills happens off screen before the events of the movie. and We never see it. I, I, so the murders are all themed, right? They're yes. all th 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 themed on the biblical 10 plagues. I'm assuming that they just maybe couldn't come up with one exactly for like. No, they describe it. They describe like, it very well like the uh, like okay so plague one is boils and so right. like a bunch of bees like a guy's in like some like like they just open his door one day it's like like his bedroom door and like he falls out and it's like he's been stung to death by bees and his face is covered with so many stings it looks like boils a lot of them are these sort of approximations of, of it right of biblical yeah. plagues but like that's so, yeah, what the i'm first wondering one, though is like did, mm. did they just that like well we could do some kind of makeup prosthetic thing but like did they think like that would be too horrific and the day were just, just like know. you know what let's let's not show that on camera but i don't There's... like i i feel like they could have but just an interesting right, right. decision. I don't think that's like more gruesome than any of the other things we have going on. This takes really unique approaches to the different plagues. Like one of the plagues is hail. And what Dr. Fibes does is that he finds this guy traveling around in his car. And the movie was filmed in 1971, but seems to take place in like the 20s or 30s. So it's got this like, it's got old school cars like from that time and like mm -hmm. this Art Nouveau aesthetic, but also it looks like 1971. So it's like you feel so out of time with this film. But just picture like an old timey car when I tell you this. Right. Yeah. Like they pipe in uh, like liquid freezing or... agent into this car, the, like liquid nitrogen or right, something. Yeah. And when they like the police find the car and they open the door, the guy's body is like completely frozen and they reach out to touch him and like parts of him crumble away. And that's the plague of hail. Yeah. The wildest one. I think the most memorable death from this movie is the frog plague, which that I think is my favorite one. It's so bizarre. So this guy goes to a party and it's a costume party. And when they get there, and this is like the one time like you, this is the first time you were like really see Phoebes out there in the world kind of interacting with one of his victims. He's also wearing his mask. He looks like he's just like another person at this masquerade ball. 
And he goes to this doctor he's trying to kill and he hands him the mask like, oh, I'm supposed to wear this. It's a frog mask. And it's not like and it's a full head mask, like a full rubber mask or whatever that you pull over your entire head. Right. And Dr. Fibes like helps him put it on and like sort of secures a latch at the back. But then that latch just keeps tightening. And it, it's not over like two or three minutes. It's not instantaneous and it's not all night. It's like he puts the frog mask on the guy and the guy's like, oh, yes, yeah, so here I am ready to have a party. Now I'm going to go mingle. And he like walks out into this group of extras who are also wearing like bedazzled animal masks. And he immediately starts getting uncomfortable and then like kind of pulling at his mask and clawing at his neck. Yeah. And then within like two minutes, he's like collapsed on the velvet stairs. It's like this thing like completely collapses his neck and he starts bleeding. And all yeah. these other party goers just like stare at him. They have no idea what's ha- happening. Um, but yeah, they're like this- not in a panic. They're just, <laughs> they're yeah, just like. I mean, huh. he's not, he's what? not, he's not screaming. Like he's not like he, he just seems to be stumbling around like he's drunk. Maybe the mask is too tight and he needs to mm. throw up or something. So they're just kind of like, what is happening with this guy here? Like they, yeah. they're, they're just confused. But this whole sequence is really, really neat. Cause um, one of the things I guess about this may may that I'm sure we'll touch on a little bit more is that Vincent Price never like actually like speaks speaks uh yeah. like he, it, 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 because of his accident that he was in he lost use of his voice and his face was really disfigured uh he was able to reconstruct his face with prosthetics. And then with his knowledge uh, of acoustics, because he has a degree in both music and like philosophy or something like that. Right. He's like um, a concert organist, right. like by profession. But he also has a Ph.D. in theology. That's why he's yes. Dr. Vibes. Yeah. So he, he he has somehow managed to like regain his voice or maybe uses some device to. Uh, yeah like, do all it, it it's it, it kind of has that sound to it like when you see someone that has the device that you stick like mm. on their neck to like help them speak um yeah it's it it just very subtly has that kind of effect yeah. on it uh but when you see him he's like looking past the chandelier like you get this like side profile of of him just looking and emoting and it is like he is just like this whole meowvi is just vincent emoting that's all it is he's not speaking you can still hear his voice because it's voiced Mm. over but he's emoting as he's watching this guy with the mask like claw at his neck while he walks up the stairs you then get like a a view of the stairs as the guy's walking up you also then get a a view from inside the, the, yeah. the mask and you see the like distorted almost like fisheye lens of these other people like looking at him and all these masks yeah. it's creepy it's horrifying and then yeah this guy just eventually like his his windpipe just collapses and the guy falls over and is dead uh, and it's it's it, it's just like, whoa, what is going on? This is cool, but it's creepy. But like, yeah, it, what is happening here? Right. Like it is kind of horrifying and kind of funny. And like this scene, like kind of comes out of nowhere. And like I knew the theme of the biblical plagues and I knew that frogs was one of them. But the fact that a guy would be killed by a mask that just happens to look like a frog, like it's so loosely yeah. thematically tied to what's going on. I love the abstraction of like how far out they can get with these murders and still tie it back to the biblical plagues. And now, something that makes this. Hmm? I, I, I was just going to say when, when you pitched this, you pitched another Vincent Price. May I owe yes. You, that almost has the exact same plot, but instead of yes. the biblical plagues, he's 
killing people or th that character is killing people based off deaths that happened in Shakespeare. Yeah, that's theater of blood where he's like a scorned <laughs> actor and he goes after all his critics <laughs> killing them with so Shakespearean funny. deaths. And then he gives his final critic like the chance to change their mind and like rewrite their review. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Yeah, so maybe this happens several times. Maybe Vincent Price, which is the guy you got to have I mean, like, hey. pick a profession out of a hat and then pick a weird theme of murders out of another hat. And you've got a Vincent Price movie. Uh, yeah. I mean, if, if it works, why not do another yeah. version of it? It's not the exact same. And you don't like, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how movie distribution works, but that could be a thing where like, hey, in this region of the country, they got that one. Whereas in this one, they got th that Mayo V instead the next yeah, yeah, or right. Like there could I don't know, but uh, a man for to, all seasons, right? To get back to the structure, yeah, you you do start to see all of these weird, bizarre mayo 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 movies. But if it like if I were to describe this movie to someone else now, I think I would want to keep the fact that he's doing this for his wife. Or because he thinks the doctors like screwed up her operation and couldn't mm. save her, all this stuff. Like, I think I would want to keep that hidden. I think I would describe this more as, yeah, it it's a, a detective story uh, about a serial killer who is killing people based off of the ten p plagues, and kind of just leave it at that. But but then leave some kind of note like, but man, the the, the sets on this are kind of ridiculous. Oh, yeah. The 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 murders are really only loosely based on the ten plagues. Like it's not what you think. Mm -hmm. Like this thing, like it is a spectacle yeah. to watch. This absolutely, the set design is gorgeous. Like he has a full on lair. And like when you go to the head doctor, when you go to Joseph Cotton's home, it's like the most 70s looking thing. Oh, yeah. It's all like oh, yellow yeah. and green and, and like plexiglass. And there's and like wood wiggles on the wall. <laughs> yeah. He's got all this postmodern furniture, even though I think it is supposed to be like the 20s. And yeah. the set design is another thing that makes this film feel so surreal because all these sets are so heightened and none of them look lived in like there's beautiful like paint treatments and like color schemes on the walls but there's not like any piece of excessive furniture like nobody has like an extra chair or table or lamp or bookcase like there aren't any of the accoutrement that makes someplace feel like a home it's like in that party scene with the frog mask it's just like a big purple room with a staircase with like a velvet stair runner and all these yeah. people milling about with their cocktail glasses and like no other objects in the set. It feels so overtly stagey, but in a way that I think does lend to both the sort of uh, B movie uh, effect of it and also the surreality and like the kind of horror of it. Like everything feels very dreamlike and, and unreal yes. and heightened. Yeah. Especially the dance <laughs> scenes in you've <sighs> described the the set right where he is playing the organ like in the center of this like big stage thing. He's kind of lifted up on this platform and he's in the back and then in like a C shape around him is where all these other musicians are. But yeah. kind of in the midst of that, there's like a big stairway and then a dance floor in the center which yeah. he is dancing this is with the mute partner right is that it what's okay or is this, this with like the visions of his wife this confused me i think i thought he was seeing visions of his wife but then i thought oh maybe that is the assistant they're both like just brunette women around the same age and like around the same body type and the assistant whose name is 
Uh, I've got it. Oh, uh, Volnavia. Yeah. She like keeps going through all these like beautiful. I think that's her. She keeps going through all these like costume changes. So she doesn't have like a uniform. Like the whole time you're like, that's her. That's her, but in a different hat. Right. So like I, I would have to watch the movie again and like better familiarize myself with the different actresses faces to tell when that's his assistant who he's sort of dancing with. Cause that's how they unwind as colleagues and friends, this. or if he's having some sort of a dream ballet with his dead wife. Let me ask you this. What do we know about the wife? Like what, what are the details that the movie gave us about the wife other than she died in surgery? Okay. We, Let me read you much? the Wikipedia plot description. Okay. Dr. Anton Fibes, a famous concert organist with a doctorate in both music and theology is believed to have been killed in a car crash in Switzerland in 1921 while racing home upon hearing upon the uh, while racing home upon hearing of the death of his beloved wife Victoria during surgery. Five survived the crash but was horribly scarred and left unable to speak. He remade his face with prosthetics and used his knowledge of acoustics to regain his voice, resurfacing secretly in London in 1925. So, yes, it is supposed to be 1925, but also it looks like 1971. Uh, yeah, I guess that is all we know about his wife. Like, we don't I think I don't think we get an answer as to why she was in surgery. Was she ill? Did she have an accident? Uh, yeah, we don't know anything about his wife. Just her name was Victoria. She was really lovely. She died in 1921. Because he has not not only are there these weird scenes where we think that might be his wife he's dancing with, but he has like a full on shrine to. to oh, her, yeah. Her where he is. He is like, I love you, my beautiful wife. I will get revenge on the doctors that could not say like oh, like he yeah, he has these weird scenes that are just kind of like, dude, you need some help, man. Like, yeah. It, like like, Whatever you you're doing here a, is not it. Um, you need a hobby. Like, I understand you want to remember your your wife who died in this, perhaps this incident of medical malpractice. And I, I understand you want a giant photograph of her in front of like a little desk where you can place flowers and roses some and things, candles but, and some of her yeah. stuff there. Yeah, you got it. You got to have a hobby besides murdering the doctors you think killed her. And yeah. like playing the organ and building an animatronic band. I also want to say this anima. I'm obsessed with the animatronic band. Can, can, Unlike be, the be, drum. Before we go on to them, can I finish what I was yes. about yes, to yes, say yes, with, yes. The, okay, with the, okay. the wife here? Uh, so I'm I'm wondering if she was a dancer, like a ballroom dancer or something Maybe, like that, yeah. and they met while he was performing some way, or they collaborated on something, and that's why they met. Uh, I know d d d d dancers, I, I, I don't think she would be in a surgery where like they could screw up so bad that the like there's six surgeons working on her or like, or, yeah, no, there, there, there's like t t there's, 10 of them. Right. There's nine uh, people all together, including the one a guy, nurse and then maybe like six surgeons and other attending doctors of different I, kinds. I, I, I don't know if because of dance, she would be in some kind of like <laughs> life threatening surgery. Right. But I could see her being in surgery <laughs> because of her profession. Like maybe she did get hurt, but yeah. good God, she must have <laughs> been in an accident. She must have been like, I don't know what happens to you that you have that many doctors on you at once. Or like she was ill and suddenly her health took a turn because he's in Switzerland right. st performing or something and has to rush back to where their home in London is, I guess. But yeah. I, it's, <laughs> we have watched both versions of Suspiria and Black Swan on the show, which do involve very life-threatening dance accidents, but I think those are the only movies with deadly dance accidents. Yeah, yeah. I, I, Just, she, she must have been in an act. <laughs> accident but yes but, uh, let's talk what about was, these animatronics this is how the movie opens okay and the drum kit says on it uh dr fibes animatronic wizards and i thought <laughs> oh maybe this is another thing he does like he was known in his career as an organist but also 
an inventor. He invented an animatronic band to play with him. You know, like he took him on the road. Uh, and now they, he has him in his private home. No, that the animatronic band is never discussed, never explained. It's just there yeah. in the mise en scene. You're just watching it happen. You don't know, like, where did they come from? He must be an inventor because he invents all these like death traps. Like the whole right. setup they have at the end with the tubes of acid that are going to take six minutes to kill the doctor's son. Like he's he's got to be a tinkerer. He's got to be making contraptions. And that includes like he made an entire uh, seven piece animatronic band, but they're all the exact same face and outfit. Like he just made seven of the exact same guy to play right. in an animatronic band. And he like painted his name on the drum kit like he was a celebrity but we have it seems like only him and his assistant ever know that he made an animatronic band no i have to say i did not so i i missed the detail of the name of, of oh. the, like and the wizards um but i when i first saw them i thought they were all real people just uh, like wearing masks, some like creepy yeah, I mask can see thing that. on because yeah, it, it, it almost looks like this paper mache style yes, mask, yes. but the face is just like a little smoother than it should be. Like no details yeah. are painted on. There's no lips painted on. There's no eyes. It's just skin. Uh, and so the whole thing is just really creepy. And it wasn't mm-hmm. until like later on in the movie that I did realize that they were animatronics. Um, But like, this is what I was talking about with the like, there's things in there that I think are really fascinating that I wish we got better looks at. Yes, we do see the animatronics. I don't feel like they were sufficiently shown off in this movie. Like I I want like those things looked horrifying. They looked creepy and I want to see more of them. I'm just wandering through a Google image search for this movie. These things are so bizarre. Yeah. Especially because you can tell, I think those are human actors that are all, I don't think they made an animatronic band. I think these are actors who are just wearing these like exactly. uncanny, like shiny, smooth, like action figure masks and like gloves and just sort of like plopping their hands up and down like keyboard cat on these instruments. Exactly. Oh my God. And then and the that's wax why it's heads. so creepy. The wax heads, too. So every time he kills one of these people, he's got this like ra- this like rotating table that's got a wax bust of every person he intends to <laughs> kill. And when he kills one of them, he lights the face on fire and lets the face melt away. And then he puts an amulet with a like hebrew symbol representing that plague on the neck of the like half melted wax bust yeah again not a, not no, and we just he see put them on the bus but he wears them when he kills the oh, <laughs> yeah. and then after he's killed them he puts the amulet on yes. on this like bust and then blow torches each head as he kills them i'm like what what is going on right. in this movie and he's like, why did you make the amulets? Why did you make the busts? Why did you make it a special, like, revolving table for the busts? He keeps doing these things that are never spoken of or explained in any way. You just keep watching him do them. You see the pattern. You comprehend the pattern. But you never understand the motivation behind anything he's doing. Absolutely. Yeah. This thing is a fever jury j- <laughs> the entire way. Um, I, just, I got to send people screenshots of this movie out of context. <laughs> <laughs> so bizarre, man. Oh, man. Um, so, yeah, yeah, we 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 already mentioned the one that for so the, the one the movie opens with is a plague of bats. We just oh see my this God, guy yeah. getting eaten alive by bats. Um, what were what were some of the other ones in there that we we haven't mentioned yet? I want to say I watched this movie with my parents, and my mom was like, "Bats don't do that. This movie's silly." <laughs> it's like, of course not. She, That's why it's so yeah, horrifying because like, they don't do that, that normally. That, 
She was upset that it misrepresented bats and like uh, speaking when you don't have an intact vocal cord. <laughs> She's like, that's how that really goes. Right. And when he like, this is one of the twit. like you see, you see him from behind and then you see him like picking up these like wax, like features, like noses and ear, like a nose and ears. These are multiple noses. And it's not. Until, and then you see just regular Vincent Price. And it's not until the end of the movie that he takes all that stuff off and you see the like melted, like skeleton face underneath. That's horrifying. That is yeah. a cool reveal when you see what he looks like underneath all the prosthesis. And like he and you realize like he does, like his mouth, like his jaws like fused shut. Like it's just skull teeth, right? It's just teeth. Like his mouth never opens. That's like a fake mouth. Like he holds like a stethoscope up to the side of his throat and that's hooked up to a phonograph. And that's how he talks to the poster of his dead wife. And you realize you've been watching Vincent Price, like doing all of the silent emoting without opening his mouth. His mouth is static the whole time. Exactly. I, I We're going to talk about these deaths in one second. I just got to say at first I was a little disappointed, like, Oh, we've picked an actor with such an iconic voice. And this is a movie where he doesn't talk much after he just like given like one speech to the dead wife poster. But then I realized, no, this is the perfect movie to watch. We all know the voice. Let's really study this man's face when he's not talking or opening his mouth at all. And you realize how much. Right. Like how much physical presence he is also outside of the voice. How he does have all these different aspects of him that work in harmony to make him so like instantly iconic and so versatile and so mm -hmm. valuable. Uh, this was a great look into his career. I'm very happy we watched this. But yeah, all the deaths. Um, other plagues. Well, so so he, like, you, he, that was just going to say, we mentioned the one of like this contraption. Uh, one of the final ones is... Uh, he kidnaps like like one of the main doctors as kids and yeah. surgically inserts a key like just below his heart and has mm. this kid hooked up to this giant contraption that in six minutes is go go going to pump him full of acid and yeah. stuff like that or like acid will like rain down on top of him yes. or something yeah. like that he's like built this series of pipes in like like plastic curly q tubes and he releases the acid and he's like it will take six minutes for the acid to drip onto your son so you have six minutes to like get the key from inside his body unlock this harness he's stuck in and wheel him away from the acid tube yeah, that one was a, a neat one because the do doctor does save his kid, but in the chaos of like getting him out and moving all of this stuff, this is where uh, mm. what was her name again? Vol uh, Volnavia. Volnavia. She gets hit by all of the uh, stuff uh, in mm -hmm. in that too. Um, oh yeah. And and then there's the other one where they're like dripping the the thing from like a smaller t t tube over the like he like drills. Let me take a step back here because he has like okay. a full body cut out. Oh my just like god! A white yes. Out. Like, why? I have no idea. Pointless. But he lays it Not d d d doesn't d serve a down. Lays it down on the floor. And then drills a hole like right in the middle of the forehead, uh, which as the hole goes through, you realize that he must be in the attic of whatever building yeah. he's in and that the hole is now looking over someone sleeping. Uh, yeah. And I, I think this is the nurse that he was yes. he, he killed. Right. And yeah. then like insert some tube in this hole and there's this like green ooze that goes in there and drips on her and like melts off her face uh no what happens is first oh, locus boy yes first he boils a bunch of brussels sprouts and that's how he makes the green goo okay i don't and then he like takes a big 
like health class outline of woman lays it down on the floor, drills through the head this of this ridiculous. like health class poster, which is going to be over the head of this nurse in her like hospital dorm room she stays in between shifts. He tr- and then he like inserts the tube. The tube drips the like congealed Brussels sprout goo all over her. She sleeps right through it. They mentioned she took a sleeping pill, so we don't. The, this is the one thing the movie bit bothers to explain is, oh, she took a sleeping pill. That's why she doesn't wake up when she's getting dr- green goo dripped on her. The goo like encases her. And then he lets out a bunch of locusts into the room. And I guess the locusts are attracted to the Brussels sprout goo. And they like, eat her, eat face, her off. face off. God, so bizarre. <laughs> so like, it's it's so creative though. Like is is, yeah. is is the thing. It's like I like I'm fascinated by these death traps or death machines or the just man. He like wild completely stuff. exsanguinates a guy for the the plague of blood. Mm-hmm. Um. God, there's one there's one for beasts. Maybe that's the bat one is beasts. Oh, yeah, the, the cattle plague. I forget. I I need like a kill count on the these. James A. Janice with dead meat. I need the, the abominable Dr. Fibes kill count. I need you to go into this. This is one of the most impressive set of kills in a movie. Right. There's Man. what's the one where he like he, they crash the guy's plane? Oh, right. Um, he, oh, that's like oh, the shit. plague of beasts. He like lets a bunch of rats loose in a guy's plane. One of the doctors like is an aviator as a side hobby. And he puts on the like little leather hat and he gets up in his biplane and he's flying around. And then all of a sudden rats, rats everywhere. And he gets so <laughs> dis- distracted that he crashes his plane. Um and like that's the thing is like you go from some elaborate death machine that he has meticulously timed out to a T. Like it'll take six minutes for the acid yeah. to drip onto to, to like. What if I just use rats <laughs> to distract him and crash the plane? Like it's so simple that it's just it's so stupid at the same time. It's just like how did you go from each extreme here? <laughs> I. And there's no scene where we see him planning anything. I think he that is kind it. of fun. Yeah. It, like you eventually come to learn. Like we knew going in because we read that plot description. He's using the biblical plagues. But because they're so abstract in the movie, I don't think that I would have realized that's what's happening until the police know. in the movie realized that's what's happening. And it, even then, like, even if you've got that concept of, okay, biblical plagues, you're never going to get to, oh, let a bunch of rats loose in a plane. Like, he, you're not keyed in. You don't see him putting things together. Or if you do, it's the scene where he's boiling a bunch of Brussels sprouts that's going to lead to locusts. But, like, you can't draw that line yourself. You can't go A to B to C. Because the movie's going, like, A to T to G to Y. It's all over the place. You're in the dark you are just along for the ride with this movie you don't know where it's going you don't you're seeing all these images you've no idea what they mean so bizarre so bizarre um let's see so then so we have to talk about the last one he has finally killed all of the doctors or most of them i think um and he it it is kind of revealed that he is kind of trying to like resurrect his wife or like be or like take care of her even though she's dead still somehow we when the police realize it might be him they're like no but he died in a car accident four years ago we have ashes and then somebody's like well how do you know those are his ashes. What if he was driving with a chauffeur and you have the chauffeur's ass- ashes? Right. And like they go to the, the tomb where supposedly like him and his wife are interred and like both uh, like they test and like like her coffin's empty. Like they're not there. Her coffin's <laughs> empty. So you realize he's something happened to her body and you don't know at that point. It's sort of ambiguous. Like maybe like, there's no way his wife was alive. 
you know, it's not like she got up and walked out of there. Like, you must have taken her corpse. And, like, we see at the end of the movie, yeah, he's got, like, one of those, like, bug out beds, one of those, like, panic room beds that, like, entirely seals upon itself. Like, this platform rises up from the floor, and it's got a bunch of mirrors on the ceiling. And then inside is, like, a rich, lush bed, and his wife is lying there. And then he, like, lies down there with her under, like, a mural of the sun and the moon and the stars. Yeah. And a bunch of sexy mirrors. But he's, at the same time he lays down in there, he's pumping his blood out into her, I think. And he's putting embalming fluid into him, right? No, he's replacing his blood with embalming fluid. Blood goes out just to like a tank of blood, I guess. And then embalming fluid goes Interesting. in. Interesting. I don't think the blood's going anywhere. I, I, I don't know. Because um, then they both get sealed in there. Like, I think right, there's a part in the movie where in. you're like, maybe she's back to life. But no, I think she's straight up dead and just like weirdly preserved really well so that she still looks practically alive, even though she's been dead for four years. Yeah. So then the cops sh- show up like right as this like secret room be- 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 bed thing seals itself. And they did. The they were just like, he was just right here. Where'd he go? Uh, they can't find him. And so they just kind of give up. And they were like, huh, I guess the last plague was the plague of darkness. And then like, that's just kind of the end. And, and you're like, oh, the, the last plague is himself like he trapped himself in this thing with his wife and it's just pitch black uh but the darkness biblically only lasts for three days so i don't know i i I, I don't know but but yeah it it just it's a weird ending to the movie where he he just kind of escapes and the cops just kind of give up they're like all right well he escaped Oh, well. Yeah, like we don't really we we've not <laughs> known what to do the whole time. <laughs> They're like not comically inept, but they they truly are like always several steps behind. And we spend a lot of time on just sort of like bland, mundane business with, the, with Scotland Yard. <laughs> Yeah, and sometimes they are really dumb. Like they're talking to to jo- Doctor Joseph Cotton. Uh, and they're like, it looks like you'll be the final death. I think he's saving you for last since you were the head surgeon. Well, the final plague, we all, you know, we all know that's coming up. You is we know the plague coming up is death of the firstborn. And Joseph Cotton's like, well, thank goodness my older brother is already dead. You know, like they can't do that one to me. And then like it takes them a while to be like, wait a minute, Joseph Cotton, you have a son. He's going to go for your son. I'm like, yeah, we've known this for an hour. We can see <laughs> that part coming very clearly. Yeah. <laughs> God, it's such an interesting movie. It's fascinating. But that but like, that's the thing is, is it's it, it like it's so bizarre that I yeah. like I just felt like I was kind of lost some of the times. I'm just like, what is happening? That's why I, I was like, it's not good per se but it's not bad the the plot is actually kind of interesting that he like he's doing it for this reason there is this detective in the mid like like it has ingredients for some interesting stuff it has some set design for some interesting stuff but yeah we just it like you said it goes from like a to t to g to this to it just bounces all over the place and it's just like yeah you had all the right things here. It's it could have been better. It's not it's a such a wild ride. It's not a cohesive movie. It's not a traditionally structured movie. It takes some really wild swings in ways you can't predict. And that ultimately don't make sense. I, yep. I don't get what the Brussels sprout thing was about. Like the stuff like the animatronic like band or the wax heads never explained. Like <laughs> all the stuff just keeps happening. And like, I don't think it's a movie that if you were to score it against like a filmmaking rule book, it would not get a positive score. But I loved this ride that I was on where like I am like playing catch up with the movie itself. And then at the end of the thing, I still do not know what was happening half the yep. time. 
it's so beautiful. It's so surreal. <laughs> it's so eerie. I I had so much fun with this. I think this is like kind of a B movie. I would classify it as that. Oh, yeah, for sure. But it has got panache and it like I think it's good. I think it succeeds on what it wanted itself to be. And I think I haven't heard of I think I've I've heard of this title before a couple times. Mm-hmm. Uh I I think the people who do know this movie really love it and I'm one of those now. I really yeah, want sure. people to find this movie. I'm I'm also like googling it. I'm I'm in a Google image search so I can revisit some of these beautiful sets. I love the poster for this movie. It's like him looking like he's about to kiss, I think, Volnavia. Uh-huh. Uh, and the poster says, love means never having to say you're ugly because it's him with his face entirely removed when he's the skeleton yeah. man. Yeah. And there's another one that's that image, but there's a big sticker over his face that says, the authorities will not permit this face to be shown on advertisements. Like it is so schlocky sensationalism. <laughs> Why? I, I dig it. I dig what this movie is about. And I want to talk briefly about what I mentioned earlier with the cinematography in this movie. Yes. There, it's The film stock looks like it's, it's almost like it's, sh- it's shot on video or something. Like sometimes it has the look of like an old soap opera. It's got mm. that kind of visual quality to it, which is it's yeah, it's It's less cinematic and more like TV studio if yeah, that m- makes kinda, sense kinda kinda but I think it adds to it's part of the soup of odd things that make this movie work for me yep. and there's a couple like really startling close ups on things there's like intense close ups like when we first get to that costume party I think it starts with like a close up on like a mask or a bottle of champagne or something and then it sort of zooms up and pans out and you see where you are you're in the middle of this costume party Mm-hmm. And also there are these really static, like distant shots. Like um, like in one of the scenes where like he's, again, we would have to go back and confirm, is this like a vision of his dead wife or is this him sort of having right. a weird flirtation with his, his assistant Volnavia? But like he, she's like sitting at like this little dinner table and he's approaching her. And like it's a a far away, it's a sort of distant, like like wide frame static shot. And there's a a shot like that later on, I think, when him and Joseph Cotton are are confronting each other. And like those, there's a tension to a shot like that when it's Mm. still and it's just there's all this negative space in the frame and it's just the actors and they're far away and there's a tension in all the things that could fill that negative space and all the movements that the actors could have like to fill with this like big static void that that is the frame of the film. I, I think shots like that, like when used well, like really work. I, there's a chill to a shot like that in a context like this, when you truly have no idea what's going on. There's some, yeah. there's something looming in a shot with a lot of negative space like that, where it's like, okay, I think I see characters going across from one side of the screen to the other, but wh- the, how, L- like physically and emotionally and plot wise, how you seem like you're leaving space open for something to happen. What is it going to be? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think the only, like the l- last thing I want to say is just kind of to reiterate that, like, I, I, I feel like there's a bunch of interesting things in here that I just I wish the the shots focused on more, um, whether it be the animatronics or uh, like, what is it like? Can we learn anything more about uh, the wife that died based on the like the shrine yeah. that's in the air? Can we learn a little bit more about her? Uh, even just like. Yeah, the, 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 there's just interesting thing like. Why did they choose to do this like inside the mask shot in the thing? But you have literally nothing else like it any other time in the film. It's just an, a weird, interesting, creative decision to put that in there. I kind of wish there was something more 
Like, yeah. do, could we have gotten a look from inside the prosthetics of <gasps> Vincent? Oh, P- I'd like Price's that. Ca- ca- character. Not sure if it would work out, but like it, it was just, it was only used for this one scene. Right. It yeah. was just like I man, the, I want to see more of that set. The like weird animatronic set, not just the animatronics themselves, but the set. Like, yeah, give me more of a sense of place, because like you said, things are dreamlike. And I think it does add to the film's kind of weird, mysterious. Something is wrong here. Mm -hmm. But I also want to know more. Like, why are they at this party? What is happening? Is this a real party? Is this one he threw? Are they somewhere? What's going on here? Um. I just I, I feel like there could be more. Somehow, somewhere like more or just like, uh, I don't know, it's 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 hard to dis- describe exactly, but you're just like, there's just some weird, interesting, creative decisions for sure. Mm-hmm. But I think that's kind of all I have to say on yeah. the abominable Dr. Fibes. I I had a great time. I recommend uh, however you can track this thing down. <laughs> Get ready for a whole time. For sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm now uh, interested in checking out the sequel to be like, what? Mm-hmm. Is, how how does how does he get out of this one, boys? And what we'll see. theme will his murders have this time? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, good stuff. Go go check it out. Go check it out. Do you have any other kind of last final thought that you want to add on there? Okay. I don't Uh, think so. Well, with that, let's let me open up bingo here and see if we have a something we can do with bingo. Um, Anika, with no time for breakfast, no Hans Zimmer score, no reaction of an animal to judge trustworthiness. You didn't have a tall bag of groceries. Expository art. No. What about the emblems? Those necklaces? No, no, this, no? It's, it's, this is not what I am talking about with expository art. I was seeking out something very specific with expository art. It's not just art that delivers exposition. It's art that exists in universe explicitly to support exposition that a character will be delivering to another character. Think about like, like when Peter Quill goes to meet his dad, he go the living planet and he go the living oh, yeah. planet. has yep. got that like big ceramic egg that just tells him everything he's done. Or like in Shang-Chi where the ant is leading is telling them about Talo and leading him through kind a of hall like of a wooden museum. statues of all Exhibit. the stuff that happened in Talo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we cannot add to bingo at this mm-hmm. moment. Um, so let's bring things back to the main screen here. There you go. Uh, Melissa, recommendations. Yeah. If people enjoy this, what else might they enjoy? Uh, we've rec- we've mentioned earlier that we watched Suspiria. Last year, we watched both versions of Suspiria, which uh, are from, I'm going to look that up and double check the years right now. The first right one is now. another 70s one, I think, Ye- if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And the new one is like- 2018? I'm almost, oh I don't man, remember. why didn't I just bring this? Yeah, 1977 and 2018. So it's yep. that 77 version. It's got a similar, like, really striking, colorful look to it. Uh, where you feel sort a of out of place, structure. out of time. Yeah. yeah. Like, r- really abrupt flashes and cuts and edits. And you spend a lot of time trying to piece together what's happening. Uh, watch Suspiria. Watch. The uh, Vincent Price is on an episode of The Muppet Show. Surprise, Kyle, I found another way to talk about Muppets. He's on season (laughs) one, episode 19 of The Muppet Show, which you can find on Disney Plus. And he does a number with a bunch of the monster Muppets, like the monster ones. And he comes out playing an organ, much like the abominable Dr. Fives. And he starts singing. You've got a friend 
Just call out my name. You know wherever I am, I'll come so running. Funny. And it's him and all the monsters. And it's a really sweet scene of like, so, there's somebody out there for everybody. And if you're one of these weird, ookie gookie creatures, somebody loves you and that person is Vincent Price. And he's here for you today. Amazing. It's really heartwarming. Amazing. And finally, I want to recommend Phantom of the Paradise. This is a movie that came out. I know I've mentioned Phantom of the Paradise before. We eventually will have to watch it. Yes. Yes, I have, Kyle. Uh, This movie came out in 1974. Uh, It was directed by Brian De Palma. And I I wonder if Dr. Fibes was at least sort of a stylistic uh, inspiration for this movie. Okay. I I looked up the plot of this movie on Google. After record producer Swan steals the music of songwriter Winslow Leach and gives it to one of his bands, Leach sneaks into Swan's offices. He is caught and uh, Swan frames him for dealing drugs and that lands him in prison. He breaks out. He again attempts to sabotage Swan's empire and an accident crushes his face. He makes his Faustian bargain with the devil And then while trying to get back at the devil, his head is smashed in a record pressing machine. And then he lives as this like Phantom of the Opera in this like massive um, like performance venue, just sort of haunting the place and trying to figure out a way to get revenge. And like he's sabotaging all the bands who like his songs have been stolen from. And there's this one singer named Phoenix who's played by the main girl from the 1977 Suspiria. That's why okay. I know I've mentioned this before. Okay, uh, sure. And he's trying to save her. He's like, I, I hate this record producer. I hate everybody who's trying to steal my songs, but her, she's a beautiful voice. I think she's pure. I think she's innocent. I need to get her out of this. I need to make sure no harm comes to her. So it's part Phantom of the Opera, part Faust, and part rock opera with songs by Paul Williams. Again, songwriter of the Muppet movie. So everything comes go. back. There you go. Good stuff. Um, I, I, while well, you've been mentioning all th- that, I've been scrolling through some of the stuff we have covered on our show for some more recommendations. Yeah. Uh, I would also put out the Love Witch, uh, yes. which is also it's it's a more modern film, but it also feels in a weird way sort of timeless because it feels like it's in the seventies. Um, mm-hmm. but they have like modern day cars and, and stuff yeah. like that. Like a, a Toyota Corolla is just sitting there on, on the side there. Yeah. Uh, but it is also this like really brightly, vividly colored mm. horror story, uh, about this witch who is murdering all these men, 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 men. Um, and, uh, that movie was also fascinating and bizarre at the same t- time yeah. that, that, that one, I think has been one of my f- f- favorites. It's, it's up there, uh, with some, some interesting mm-hmm. some stuff there. Uh, I, I would also, you know, if, if you want the more like detective side of this thing, why not go watch Sherlock? Yeah, in a weird way, this feels kind of like an episode of Sherlock. This seems I like that. it's something that one of the serial killers or criminal who whoever that Sherlock would take down in an episode of of his show. Uh, so yeah, go watch Sherlock. Why not? Why not? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, those those were the recommendations that I wanted to toss out there as well. OK, solid. Mm-hmm. All right, Melissa, it is my turn to do pitches for next yes. week. Um, so I we have not done a horror television show uh, this month yet. So we have I not. Wanted to That's true. Pitch uh, some horror t- TV shows. We've done movies. We've done comics. Now let's get some TV shows in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this, the three series I have here, the longest one is 10 episodes. There's two okay. of them that are 10 episodes and there's one that's eight. Um, okay. But I, I, I wanted to get some mostly recent stuff in there. My mm-hmm. p- pitch for, 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 for this week actually changed a bunch 
uh, oh, like, yeah. like before here. I was like, I should do this thing, but We're, I don't know. I, I can't really find them on streaming platforms, so I don't know if I really want to do that one yet, but oh well. We're in a good time for horror TV, and especially if you we branch are, that yeah. out into just general murder. Lots of murder TV you can watch. Mm -hmm. So, uh, recently I signed up for a subscription to Apple TV Plus, or whatever it's called. Uh, so I wanted to, to pitch season one of Servant. Ha <laughs> ha! I, I had a feeling you would uh, already know what this one is about. It is an M. Yes. Night Shyamalan TV show. That's uh, my boy. And this one looks sufficiently creepy. I've seen the trailer. <laughs> uh, it is bizarre. <laughs> it meets the creepy quota. It does. Uh, this is about a wealthy Philadelphia couple, Dorothy and Sean Turner, uh, and they experience a fracture in their m m m marriage after the death of their 13-week-old son, Jericho. The couple undergo uh, transitory object therapy using a lifelike reborn doll after D D Dorothy experiences a full psychotic break. Um, the doll, which D D D D Dorothy believes is her real child, was the only thing that brought her out of a catatonic state following her son's death. Six weeks after, they hire a young nanny. Leanne Grayson to move in and take care of Jericho, the reborn doll, opening their home to a mysterious force. Uh, while Sean deals with the grief on his own, he becomes deeply suspicious of Leanne. Um, so yeah, just a, a, a weird premise. Uh, I, I, there's only one actor that I recognize in this, and that would be Rupert Grint from the Harry Potter movies. Good old Ron. Um, so that would be pitch number one. That being said, it also looks like Melissa's camera has frozen. Uh, so we are going to take a quick break while we figure out that, uh, and I'll be right back okay and we are back after like, some quick technical difficulties uh melissa let me get on to pitch number two here yeah uh this one is very recent this only came out in the last week or so this is midnight club on netflix yeah uh this is a horror mystery thriller uh created by mike flanagan uh, you guys might know his other shows that he's done. The Haunting of uh, Hill House. The or Is that it? No. Right. The Haunting of Hill House and The Haunting of Bly yes. Manor. And then he those did, are his and the the it's a, the another other midnight thing because he's done like haunting, yeah. haunting, midnight, midnight. And then it's like midnight mass or something. Yes, midnight mass. That's it. So this is his most recent one. Uh, it is mm. called The Midnight Club, and it says a group of eight close, terminally ill young uh, adults reside Ooh. in the Brightcliff Home Hospice run by an enigmatic doctor. They meet at midnight every night to tell each other scary stories. One night, they make a pact that the first one to succumb to their disease is responsible for communicating with the others from beyond the grave. After oh. one of them d d dies, bizarre occurrences begin. Huh. So, Interesting. There you go. Yeah. Uh, I have actually not seen any of Mike Fl Flanagan's shows. Me I've either. heard nothing but great things. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, he was somehow at one point i don't know if he still is attached to making an adaption of something is killing the children i think somehow oh that I, sounds I, fitting yeah i don't know if he was like producing it or directing it or do, who knows what but uh something is killing the ch ch children is one of my my current favorite mm -hmm. comics uh so i'd like to check out one of his shows here uh, and this is his most recent one, The Midnight Club. That's pitch number two. Pitch number three, uh, you can stream this one on Amazon. It's an Amazon original uh, called I Know What You Did Last Summer. 
based oh. off uh, the book of the same name. And of course, if you're a, a book, a horror fan, you will also know the movies uh, of the these same name, too. But this is a television show adaption. Wow. Um, of course, this is about a group of young adults um, who are stalked by a brutal killer uh, a year after uh, this secret that they are all keeping. So, uh, not that I, I, I feel like there's not much to say on this one because uh, yeah. uh, it's pretty well known within the horror community, I feel like. Um, yeah. Yeah, have you seen those movies? Slasher. Or at least the first one. I have not. You, you know me. Oh. I'm not a big horror fan, I, so I, I, I have stayed away from all of these here. Uh, first one, I, I've never seen any of the sequels. Like I can't speak to their quality, but that first one is a good time. There you go. There you go. It says uh, the Amazon Studios announced the series development in 2019 with Neil H. Morris and. Um, with Neil H. Moritz and James Wan serving as executive producers. Uh, it was given straight to order series, blah, blah, blah. Cool. That came out. Mm. It premiered October 15th, 2021. So okay. there you go. That is mm. pitch number three. I know what you did last summer. Pitch number one, servant. Pitch number two, the midnight club. And pitch number three, I know what you did last summer. Ah, I don't think we should watch the series until you've seen at least the first movie. And we're both in the same boat with Mike Flanagan. I know him by reputation. Uh, I think I've watched like I watched like a recap video of Dr. Sleep. Like I was like, I don't know if I'm in for Dr. Oh, he did Sleep. Dr. Sleep, but I too. I think so. Interesting. OK, he's got quite a horror pedigree. And does, I watched yeah. like the first episode of Haunting of Hill House to get a taste for it. And I want to continue with it. And I don't know if I should jump in and fully watch the latest thing he's done when I know he's got like such a solid history of other stuff I've been meaning to get to. I kind of want to watch some of his earlier stuff and get a bit more context for what he's doing, at least like stylistically, you know. I gotcha. uh, but you know what I do have context for? M. Night Shyamalan! And you do too! We've talked about uh, Unbreakable Split and Glass on the show before. Uh -huh. uh, we've, um, yeah, we, of course, we've, we've seen a number of his Mayovies may right. over the and I, years. So, yeah, and he's a the, he's had a spotty career, but for me at least, when he hits, he hits. And I know Servant is a show that's I haven't heard a lot about it, but I know it's gone on to several seasons. It's so at least I'm, on season three. I think they've completed right. three seasons now of this show. So. There's, we'll there's got to be something to it. I, I want to see his TV work. I've been meaning to check out this and Wayward Pines, uh, which has also shown up several times in the pitch rotation and we haven't gotten to it. So let's watch season one of Servant. Sounds good. And I think this is also like a kind of horror that we haven't tackled yet really on the show. Like just this like creepy doll, right? Like we, we haven't done like creepy doll horror. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So. Cool. Good stuff. That is what we shall do for this next week. Uh, you guys can find Servant on Apple TV Plus. I believe season one is 10 episodes. So go go ch check it out. And that's what we will do for okay. this next week. So, Melissa, where can the people find you on the Internet? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at WilkyWit. That's W-I-L-K-Y-W-I-T. Listen to my other podcast, Saturday Morning Obscurities, a show where me and my brother Jams talk about weird old kid shows you feel like only you remember. We had some Halloween episodes coming out this month. Cool. And if you're in the St. Louis area, come to Blueberry Hill Tuesday nights at 7 where I am hosting a free pub quiz. Cool. Sounds good. That's awesome. Good stuff. If you guys want to follow me, I am at Yo Kyle Springer on Twitter. If you'd like to stay up to date with all the stuff that we do here at The Whatnots, we are at The Whatnots on Twitter. So please go like, share and subscribe. That would help us out a ton. You're on the YouTube version. We got some more videos right over there for y'all to check out. Uh, and we appreciate it. That being said, this is number 227 of The Whatnots Review Show. 
Uh, we will see you all next time. Bye. Bye.